So I heard a good story on the way to work today. It was about the governor of Massachusetts from many, many years ago. He was running for his second term. He was out there going all over the state and doing his stump speeches. He found out that there was a large church in his state that was having an annual church picnic. He thought this was his perfect opportunity to share his political platform and to get a good lunch out of the deal. And so he goes to the church, he does his stump speech, he's done with this stump speech, he's going through the serving line, and as he goes through the serving line, he puts out his plate, and the lady serving the chicken gives him one piece of chicken. He says, um, ma'am, I don't want to complain, but, uh, you know, I'm really, really hungry. Do you think you could, you could give me a, a second piece of chicken. And she said, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, but um, the person who put me in charge here said that I can only give one piece of chicken to every person that comes through the line. The guy says, are, are you sure? Just, just a second piece. Nobody will even know about it. I'm really, really hungry. She says, well, I, I, I just want to do what the person said. I can, I'm sorry, I can only give you one piece of chicken. The governor at that point, who was not a pretentious person by any means, leans forward and said, ma'am, um, I don't know if you know who I am, but I'm the governor of Massachusetts. And she smiled real big and she said, and I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. <laughs> so here's my hope for today. I hope you came in spiritually hungry today, right? I hope you came in spiritually chunk because today I have the great honor again to be in charge of feeding the Word of God. So we're so glad that you're here today. Uh, my text today is found in Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 27, um, and, uh, and I'm excited to, to share this with you. Again, as, uh, as Sybil uh, said, as, uh, as Tom also shared, we're continuing a message series, a two-month message series on love. And if there's anybody in the Tampa Bay area that needs to be experts on that very, very important subject. It is the saints here at New Beginnings Christian Church. And so we're specializing on this. I want to just draw attention very, very quickly, just a little bunny trail. I want to, again, highlight our new giving platform. It's a new online giving platform. I was told after the fact that last week I called it a giving app. It's not an app. It might be an app pretty soon. But right now, if you go to the church website, there is an icon there that says give. It is a very user-friendly way for you to give online. And so uh, we're just encouraging our people, check that out. I think you're going to find it to be extremely easy to follow. Uh, The second thing that I want to kind of promote with you guys today is Sunday school. Now, I know Sunday school is kind of one of those traditional kind of things that, that a lot of churches offer, and a lot of churches nowadays don't offer. We do here at New Beginnings. And Jesus said that we're to go out into the world and we're to make disciples. That the most important thing that we can be are disciples. Well, that means that we're students. That means that we're people that are are interested in the Word of God, who want to go deeper, who want to intentionally connect with truth. And we've got tremendous Sunday school ministry here at New Beginnings Christian Church for, for everybody in your family. There's a Sunday school opportunity at 9.30 every single Sunday morning. And so we want to encourage you to come be a part of that. I know some of you said, man, I really like coming to the 10.30. I get to sleep in a little bit later. Hey, I get that as well. How many real people came to church today? Real people, real people like to sleep. How many know sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is get some rest? Amen. <laughs> that if God had to rest, so do we. And I, I totally get that. But I would encourage you, if you're not currently engaged in our Sunday school program here, come a little bit earlier. Check it out for a couple of weeks. I think what you're going to find is that you're going to love the people that you're studying with. You're going to love the people facilitating it. And you're going to already be inspired by the things that you're going to glean by being in that group together. So there's my cheap plug for Sunday school. Hope you'll take advantage of that. That's kind of a big deal. Happy Valentine's Day 2021. Man, that is absolutely Awesome. My Valentine is not here uh, today. We've got a six, three, uh, a six, three and a half year old uh, back at the house, so I'll get to see her uh, in a little while. But uh, this is a great day. I love Valentine's Day. And, and, and what I need to ask, especially today, to ask you who woohooed when I ask if you're a real person, is, is how have you or, or how are you expressing love this year? 
How have you, perhaps already, maybe yesterday, maybe this morning before you came to church, or, or how will you express love this year? All told, Americans are spending roughly $50 billion on Valentine's Day this year. Broken down, that's $27.9 billion on gifts, $21.9 billion on Valentine's Day, uh, Valentine's Day related activities. According to the National Retail Federation, the average consumer will spend $161, with men spending about twice as much than women. In the United States, 58 million pounds of chocolate, on average, have been purchased within the last seven days leading up to today. And the country that spends the most per capita on Valentine's Day? Singapore. Singapore, where 60% of the population spend up to $500 leading up to this holiday. And so all the single ladies, uh, I hate to break it to you, but your love is on the other side of the planet. And uh, <laughs> reminds me of the man and the woman who went out on their first Valentine's date dinner after dating for several months. The man in that very romantic moment looked across the table and said, Honey, it's Valentine's Day. I, I admittedly, I'm not rich like Jack. I, I don't have a mansion like Russell. I, I don't have a Porsche like Martin. But I do love you. She looked at him. She blushed. She said, Oh, dear. I love you, too. What was that you said about Martin? More important than the way we express love to one another, which, by the way, is very important, is the question, how do we express love to God? What is his love language? Last week, I talked about how God loves us. And maybe if you were here last week or you watched online, you may remember me saying that God loves us perfectly and God loves us unconditionally and God loves us immeasurably. But the question for today is, is how do we reciprocate love to him. Scripture makes it emphatically clear that, that we are all called to love God. But what's his love language? What's that language of love? What are the actions of love? What connects with God? See, as a modern day follower of God, a believer in God, and as an advocate for the Lord Jesus Christ, I need to be, and we need to be collectively very, very interested in what God says. That God has a specific way that Love, and, and I love you, really resonates with him. And it's not just words. And so how did he say we are to love him? If you had lived thousands of years ago, it would have been a unique way. If you would have been a Jewish person living thousands of years ago, it would have been a very, very defined and a easily modeled way that you would see around you. You see, Jewish men, some 2,000 years ago and older, they, twice a day, morning and evening, would repeat the Shema. We would refer to that as Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. And when Jesus comes along, Jesus is approached, as we find out in our text today, by an expert in the law. He was an attorney. He knew the Old Testament covenant way better than most of the people that he lived around. And we remember the story where he intercepts Jesus one day, and he asks him, he says, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus doesn't stutter. He tells him the Shema. You do the Shema. And then not only the Shema, but then he tacks on with even greater elaboration, Leviticus 19, verse 18. And so what did Jesus tell the man? It's our text for today, Luke 10, verse 27. He said this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. One more time. Everybody together. Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart and with what? All your soul and with what? All your strength and with what? All your mind. And while you're doing that, by the way, love your what? How? As yourself. As yourself. What does that mean? 
What does that mean? I, I remember in, in Sunday school, I remember just hearing that all the time. I've taught this many times, but, but really what does that mean? I think some of it needs a little bit of elaboration. If you're taking notes, why don't you do some fill-ins right now? That all of our heart means the, the seat of our emotions and our motivation. Our heart, when he says, love the Lord with all your heart, he's not talking about that fist-sized muscle in the middle of your, your rib cage. He, he's talking about something that's so much deeper than that. He's talking about the seat of our emotions. Now, we know that emotions are a gift from God. One of the many ways that God made us uniquely in his image is that he has emotions, and we get to experience a wide variety of emotions that are similar to God. But also, it's our motivation, it's our want to, it's our engine, it's our why we do things. And here Jesus tells this guy, man, you need to just absolutely just love him with all of your emotions, and you need to love him with, with all of your motivation. A second thing is to, is to love him with, with all of our soul. What does that mean? That means it's the core of our personality. Each one of us has a unique personality. Now we know personalities sometimes clash, don't they? But the personality you have is a unique mixture of certain attributes that you have that come together, and, and there's no one bad personality. How many of you, hey, real people, you still with me? Ever met somebody with a bad personality? Anyway, um, we may say it's a bad personality, but God doesn't make bad personalities. What do we mean by that? That each one of us are not cookie cutters, we're not cyborgs, we don't all just look alike, sound alike, process alike, but that each one of us, our unique personality, which there are many, each one of those is equipped to vertically give everything we have to God. No exemptions, no exemptions. If you're kind of the, the wallflower, if you're an introvert, guess what? You can still love God expressively with all that you have. And so you're to love Him with your emotions, you're to love Him with your motivation, you're to love Him with your personality, all of your strength. What does that mean? All that's within you. All that's within you. All of my might. All of my strength. Everything is for Him. Ultimately, what maybe somebody needs to decide today, maybe if you're watching online, something you need to decide today, is you need to answer the question, what's the ultimate in your life? See, by definition, I, I love that, that Tom uh, gave us the definition, the Webster's definition of the tithe. By definition, according to Webster, there can only be one ultimate. And so what is it for you? What is it for, for you? What is the ultimate in, in, in your life? What is that thing you give everything to? What is that thing you don't even hesitate about pouring your life and your resources and your, your time into? What is that? Be honest about that. And that's what Jesus said. And that's what the ancients said. Man, we are to love him with, with everything that is in with, within us. Yes, we, we love other things. We love our families. We love our country. We love all kinds of things. But when it comes down to it, what's the ultimate? What was the ultimate for them? What was the ultimate for the expert in the law? Most importantly and personally, what's most important and the ultimate for you? What's that thing that you're giving everything that you have to? And then lastly, Jesus said we're to love him with all, not some, not partiality, not just on Sunday when it's really popular to think about these things, but all of your mind. What does that mean? We are to be consumed with him. Not just on Sunday morning at 8.30 out in the drive-in, not just at 10.30 here and here. We are to be consumed with him. Why? Because he is Lord. Why? Because he is master. Why? Because he is God. Why? Because there is no one else like him. Why? Because he is the lone creator and everything else is created. And so we have to be consumed with him. Doesn't mean we're weird. Doesn't mean that we're just odd. And, and No, that's what God doesn't call us to be those people. But instead that we know that we're motivated and that everything from him is ultimately for him. And therefore, he is worthy of my all. Jesus, what's the translation? What did you tell this guy? Everything. Everything. How do we love God? With, with everything. Everything kind of love. 
everything, everything that's within us, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, all of our mind, we are to love God within everything kind of love. Some of you might be saying, well, Steve, you seem to be pretty excited about that. But how do I make that work in my day to day? What does that look like? I, I get the theory, I get the abstract, I get the ideas, but, but, but how do I shoehorn that into my Monday through Friday? How do I shoehorn that into my, my workplace? How do I shoehorn that into my family and my marriage and my parenthood and, and all these other things that, that, that consume my life and my calendar? How do I make that work? Let me share with you just quickly four, I believe, practical manifestations of, of giving God the everything love that he asked for and he so richly deserves. Here's the first one. Don't miss it. By obedience. By obedience. I found it so interesting that on the eve of his crucifixion, three times in John chapter 14, Jesus reminds his followers then, and I believe today, Valentine's Day 2021, that love equals obedience. Love equals obedience. If my wife, who again, I, I wish was here with me today, if she said, Steve, after church today, I need you to go to the store and I need you to pick up a gallon of milk and bring it home for lunch today. And I come home in a little while and I come home with a quart of orange juice. And I say, honey, I know it's not what you asked for, but I love you so much. Guess who's going to go back to the store? <laughs> Jesus said love is in obedience. Jesus asked the question, listen, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Here's what I know, guys, is that Jesus doesn't want our lip service. There's enough people in the world doing that. He doesn't want that from the people at New Beginnings Christian Church. He deserves more than our lip service. Either he is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And we've got to figure that out. Maybe there's somebody here, or again, maybe somebody watching online, and you're still waiting to settle the lordship issue. My prayer is that you settle that quickly in a very, very uncertain world that we live in. Settle the lordship issue issue. And if you're going to call him Lord, that means obedience worked into that. And obedience isn't just doing what the Lord or the Master demands, but just as important, it also means intolerance towards sin in our life. Sometimes when we think, man, obedience, obedience, okay, he just wants me to do this and check these things off my list. Yes, there are things that we need to all be obedient to. But listen, if I am petting secret sin, if I am harboring and protecting sin in my life, if I know that there are things that I am doing apart from this setting that are egregious to the heart of God, that are grieving the Holy Spirit, guess what? That's disobedience as well. God is calling us to be obedient. Why? Because love equals obedience. God says, you tell me I love you when you're obedient to do the things that I tell you to do. Why? Because Father knows best. Here's the second thing, is loving myself. Loving myself. Jesus said, love your neighbor, how? As yourself. How many of you would say, ah, that kind of, I'm not so sure about that one. I, I, yes, the neighbor part, but as myself, I, that's kind of, how many of you, real people, have ever met somebody who loves themselves a little too much? <laughs> they're really not too hard to, to spot out there. They're not too hard to, to identify. And so when we hear, you're, oh man, she, woo, she really loves herself. Is that ever a compliment? <laughs> no! What are we saying? Man, she is really consumed with herself. Man, she is just, maybe has a sense of self-righteousness. Man, she is just so obsessed with her own whatever, whatever. And, 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 and that's not what Jesus is, is talking about here. That's not egotism. That's not runaway pride that he's saying. Man, you have to be totally self-centered and egotistical to love your neighbor. That, that makes no sense at, at all. That kind of mindset, 
gives a rip about their neighbor. And so that's not what he's talking about. Listen, to not love yourself is to, is to deny God's workmanship and express that you're not worth live, lo loving. Well, let me say that one more time. To not love yourself is to deny God's workmanship and express that you are not worth loving. Is that what the cross says? No. Listen, to not love yourself is anti-Bible. It's anti-Gospel. It's anti-Cross. It's anti-Christ. That's a big offense. Typically, anti-Christ, whenever you say anti-Christ, man, we're like thinking of, oh man, that's like the omen, man. You know, that's, uh, that's really, really bad stuff. But listen, when we say, man, I'm just... I'm just not worth anything. I'm just, a, suddenly we get in that Eeyore mode, you know. I'm not worth anything. I'm just the, you know, the catfish of the world. You know, everybody just, you know, I'm the punching bag for everybody. I'm just, a, is that how God sees you? Because when I think about the cross, I think we find our worth in that. And, 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 and your worth is not found in the fact that Man, I am so worthy, that's why He loves me. But instead, I am worthy because He loves me. Somebody needed to get that just now. Some of us think, oh man, because I am so, and I am so, and I am so. Man, who wouldn't love me? Certainly God's going to love me. No, your worth and your value is because He loves you. That's why we see value in every human life. That's why we march abortion clinics. That's why we do these things as Christians. Why? Because we know that every life is sacred. And that worth comes intrinsically from a holy God. Your life is sacred. Your life is unique to Him. There is nobody else on this blue people planet exactly like you. He didn't say, you know what, what I'm going to do, I got, for Taylor here, man, I'm going to, I guess I'll make about three dozen of him, and uh, I'll spread them out across the earth. They'll never run into each other. And uh, every one of us is unique in every single way that you can be unique, and that's how he sees you as unique. Today is, uh, you may have seen it online, today is Sam and Abby's Gotcha Day. Gotcha Day, for us keepers is the day we officially adopted them. And, uh, and each one of our kids, we have nine kids, eight are adopted, and uh, in each one, we celebrate not only their physical birthday, but we celebrate their, their gotcha day. And, and, and each one, though we kind of, with them, we kind of, you know, like Costco, we kind of shrink wrap them together on celebratory days like that. Each one of them is unique in every single way. And God sees you uniquely to say, man, I, I though he loves me, I don't. I don't love or I don't have an appreciation for myself. It's to deny his workmanship, his unique workmanship to make you who you are uniquely you. So what am I saying? It's a big, big deal. How do you know if someone properly loves themselves? I think a couple of things in a healthy way. First is the way they treat their bodies. The way they treat their bodies. Some of you are saying, uh, move to the next point quickly. Um, <laughs> People who understand their worth to God recognize that their bodies have a sacred value, that they are the temples of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean you don't eat the extra Krispy Kreme. That doesn't mean, you know, a guilty as charged, real people. But that we generally take good stewardship. Why? Because our bodies are our unique habitation and and they come from God, and we don't take them with we. They're here for a holy purpose. Or, or here's another way that you can tell if people really love themselves in the proper way, is again, just their sense of self-worth. Man, I am who God said I am. That's why we need to know from Scripture, what did God say about me? If you go to 1 Peter, he says, man, you're a holy person. You're a chosen person. You're a special person to me. Man, see, when I know who I am to him, man, it just changes everything. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but you know what? Guess what? Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's what God says about me. Sometimes when you stand on a platform every week or you make some decisions that aren't popular, I know, that I've seen that, I've been doing this quite a while now, 
you can get kind of vandalized by, by the opinions of other people. But at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters, and listen, the only thing that really matters in your context is what God says about you. And God has a lot to say you, about you in Scripture. And he says some very, very wonderful things about his love and his devotion to you. And so be obedient. It's uh, I love you to God. Love yourself in a proper and a healthy and a humble way. Seeing yourself accurately. Thirdly, love your neighbor. Loving my neighbor is essential. Here's a question, real people. Are your neighbors always easy to love? Are the people around you always easy to love? Are they a little bit sometimes hard to love? Come on, real people. Real people, right? Right? Real people. Sometimes my neighbor is hard to love. I love this. This reminds me of the little old lady who was very, very spiritual. Every single day she had a routine. She would step outside of her house onto her patio, raise her arms and say, praise the Lord. One day an atheist bought the house next door to her and became very irritated at this old lady's daily routine. So after a month or so, after she went out on her patio at about the same time every day, raised her arms to heaven and said, praise the Lord. She heard somebody from across the stockade fence say, there is no Lord. And yet, it didn't stop her at all. She just continued doing that every day. Until one day, one cold winter day when the little old lady couldn't get to the store because of a really heavy snow falling. She goes out onto her porch, she raises her hands to the sky, and she says, Lord, help me. I have no money. The snow has been falling. I can't get to the grocery store. Lord, I have no food. The next day, there were three bags of groceries on her front step. She went out to the patio, she raised her arms, she said, praise the Lord. About that time, out of the bushes comes the atheist. He said, ha, 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 there is the, I told you, there is no Lord. I bought those groceries for you. The little old lady raised her arms to seven and said, praise the Lord. You sent me groceries and you made the devil pay for them. <laughs> Amen. Neighbors sometimes aren't easy to love. But remember, love is not an emotion. Love is a decision. It's a decision. I am going to love this person. I know my personality doesn't exactly interlink with theirs. I know maybe their language and their use of colorful language doesn't exactly resonate with me. I understand that this is a very different person, but, but I'm making a decision. See, love is an absolute decision. And I think so important is that we remember that with the Holy Spirit's help, we can do everything that God requires of us. Sometimes it seems really tough, the things that God requires. His love language sometimes really is not very easy for us, especially on this one. But listen, Everything he calls us to do, we can do with his help by the Holy Spirit. And I think likewise important, and a good tip, is don't expect love in return. That's where we can get our hearts broken. That's where we can get disillusioned with all of this. That's where we can stop instead of keep speaking his love language. Why? Because they, they weren't as nice to me as I was to them. Real people, listen closely. Some people can't handle love. Some people have been hurt in their lives, and they frankly don't have any natural way to feel the love that you're throwing towards them. Some people are extremely uncomfortable with affection. Some people are just skeptical. Why is this person being so nice to me? There's got to be a catch. Some people are not going to reciprocate Love, the same measurement by which you dished out love, sometimes is not going to come back in that same full measure. But don't expect it. Don't expect it. Look at how God loves everybody. 
And yet we know that today many people don't love God back. Does that somehow stop Him from being God? It, does it stop Him from loving them and, and sending rain on their yards? And No. And so we're to love like He loves. And that's so important that we do. And so don't expect it to come back. Sometimes we get so disillusioned. Man, I, I really went out of my way. I thought that was a way that God was telling me to show love towards that person. And man, I barely even got a response from that person. Man, don't, don't expect that in any kind of way. It'll only hurt your heart. But sometimes it comes back on the wave by which you send it out. Lastly, it's the hardest one is loving my enemy. <laughs> loving my enemy. People who have hurt you. People who still want to hurt you. Jesus said, man, you love God when you, when you do the thing that doesn't feel so natural. Love your enemy. Admittedly, again, this is the most challenging one. Neighbors around me, okay, I can do that. I, I can help them. I can, I can love on them. I can loan things to them. But this is this is, again, for somebody that has hurt you. And man, we just, as humans, fallen humans, we come up with new ways to hurt each other all the time. Jesus said, you still have to love them. I not only say it, but I modeled it. That just as I turned a cheek, you can turn a cheek. Just as they ask you to go one mile, you can go two. Again, you can do these things if you let the Holy Spirit work in you and through you and with you to do these things. But it requires, friends, absolute utter reliance on the Spirit. Loving your enemies is an act of the will. It's not emotion. If you're waiting for the right motion to be your motivation engine to go out of your way to love somebody who dislikes you, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. No, this is an act of the will. This is an act of obedience. This is, requires discipline and determination. And it makes them crazy when you love them. It's the great payback. <laughs> Scripture said, man, it's like heaping, heaping coal, shovel loads of coal on people's heads when you love people who are unlovely to you. I know we're not supposed to be about vengeance, or retribution, that's God's territory. But it does say it messes them up. It messes them up when you love people that, that don't expect you to ever love them. It's awesome. And so I leave you with Steve's audaciously annoying big final question. Is God getting everything love from you? Is he getting your obedience? Are you giving him his love language of loving yourself in a proper manner by which he loves you and can't stop loving you? Or are you loving your neighbor? And are you really showing that you love him by going that extra step of loving your enemy? Just a last timely reminder is that at one time, we were all enemies of God. Long before Stephen Jeffrey Kiefer got on church platforms, spoke loud, moved his hands, and perspired in front of people. <laughs> Though I grew up in the church, that was my problem. I grew up in the church, but I didn't grow up in Christ. Somebody needs to hear that today. I grew up in the church. I knew how to act. I knew the rules to follow. I knew when to be a good boy, how to dress, when to stand, when to sit, who to say yes, sir, to. But I didn't grow up in Christ. And that's the thing that was the game changer for me but I was an enemy of God. And today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to prove that that point is real, he's going to send rain right now.
today you might be an enemy of Christ. And I love you enough to tell you that. You're either a friend or a child of God, or you are an enemy of God. And today, let me love you enough to tell you the truth, or if you're listening or watching online, that God, by His Son's sacrificial and atoning death on the cross, has given you exactly what you need to be His child, to have your sins removed. Why live as an enemy of God? That's scary when you stop and you think about it. I would much rather be a child of God. Being a child of God doesn't mean the boogeyman automatically goes away. As I look around there, I see people going through things. Tracy, I'm looking at you. We're just getting real personal right now. You're going through so much with your dad right now. Faithful sister in Christ didn't make the bad things go away. I'm looking at my father-in-law dealing with stage four cancer. I'm looking at some of you and what you're going through right now. I feel almost feel like we could just have a kumbaya moment right now. <laughs> being a child of God, being a friend of God doesn't make everything bad, just bippity boppity boo go away. But if you don't receive Jesus Christ by faith and download his grace, today you stand as an enemy of God and my soul is afraid for you. And so I just pray that while there's time and while you're here and while His Spirit is moving right now, I'm just, I'm just beseeching you. I love on the at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, after Peter preaches and he stands up with the 12 and, and he says and he shares the, that news and 3,000 people get saved and, and oftentimes forgotten is that and he pleaded with the people. It's not beneath me to plead with you today. Because heaven, heaven is at stake. And so is hell. Don't be an enemy of God. At one time we were all enemies of God, but praise God. I love in Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Long before you cleaned up your act, long before you made church attendance a priority on your Sunday mornings, Jesus died for you. What do you do with that? We love him back. We love him back. And as he was willing to die for us, we are willing to live for him and die if we must. Don't be an enemy of God's. There's too much at stake. And this world is too uncertain to play around with it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've told us in Scripture there's a way that you hear I love you. Father, would you give us the good sense to tell you I love you in the language that you hear it best. Thank you for first loving us. Not when we were all spit polished. But Father, in, in our worst, most depraved, our most perverse, our most obstinate, and our most mutinous, that's when you went to the top of a Roman cross. Thank you, Father, for loving us like that. Help us to love you in return. We pray this in the name of the one who first loved us and proved it.